Greetings, Greenhouse people. This episode is very timely. If you're listening in real time, it's week 26, and temperatures across North America are heating up or just plain hot. And you know what that means. Disease pressure is high in greenhouses and outdoor nurseries. Thankfully, we're here to talk about summer challenges, what to watch for, why diseases are rampant, and what to do about them. My returning guests are Dr. Ann Chase and Dr. Aaron Palmatier, and I definitely want to thank our friends at CPRO for helping me bring them both back to Tech on Demand, following up on their extremely popular last appearance. Last time I talked with Ann and Aaron, we discussed what to expect from a disease perspective in spring production. If you didn't listen to that one, jump back in the archives and check out episode 33. For episode 39... This one, we're moving on to summer. But first, my guests reflect back on spring for a bit before jumping right into warm season diseases like Phytophthora, Rhizoctonia, soft rots like Erwinia, Southern Blight, Xanthomonas, and plenty more. They discuss what they've seen in greenhouses and nurseries already this summer and what they expect to see soon. In fact, I lost count at about 25 diseases they've seen firsthand already. One of the most interesting parts of this cast is a rundown of common diseases and the temperature ranges that bring them on. We wrap up by talking about why producing crops out of season often requires the most vigilance and hardest work by your team before an in-depth look at the most cutting-edge control strategies for summer diseases. Just like my last episode with Ann and Aaron, this one is fantastic. These two are so knowledgeable and their conversations are always backed by research. I'm so happy they could join me again for the Tech on Demand podcast brought to you by Grower Talks, where our goal is always to bring you tips, tricks, and information to produce your best crops ever. And be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app, like iTunes, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, and now on Odyssey. That way you'll never miss an episode. I'm your host, Bill Calkins, and I'm very excited to be joined by these two wonderful guests. Let me run through their bios real quick, because they are quite impressive. Dr. Ann Chase graduated from the University of California at Riverside with a Ph.D. from the Department of Plant Pathology in 1979. She was Professor of Plant Pathology at the University of Florida, Central Florida Agricultural Research and Education Center from 79 to 1993. Then she started Chase Horticultural Research in February 1994. The business conducted contract research, diagnostics, consulting, and training through talks and writing on diseases of ornamentals. Chase Agricultural Consulting was opened in December 2011, specializing in educating and consulting with growers and suppliers in ornamentals, as well as select agricultural crops. She and her husband Mike continued to produce the monthly newsletter Chase Digest, as well as Ask Ann for quick consultations on disease ID and control. She and Mike are also back in the business of trials in their Arizona operation, which recently relocated to North Central Phoenix. One of the companies they conduct trials for is CPRO, so she and the second guest spend plenty of time together talking through various diseases and chemistries. Dr. Aaron Palmatier is the technical development lead for the ornamental businesses at CPRO, and he started in the ornamental industry as a faculty member in the Department of Plant Pathology at the University of Florida, where he is currently a courtesy professor. His expertise lies heavily in plant diagnostics and identifying diseases and disorders. He's authored numerous publications, including extension fact sheets and technical bulletins focused on managing pests and diseases of ornamental plants. He has extensive experience conducting pesticide efficacy trials and results from his research are widely practiced in the ornamental industry. Currently, Ann and Aaron are working on the second edition of the Compendium of Diseases of Ornamental Foliage Plants, originally published by Ann in 1987, and the dynamic between these two is as energizing as the results of their trials and research. So without further ado, let's get started with Greenhouse and Nursery Diseases, a focus on summer, with Dr. Ann Chase and Dr. Aaron Palmatier. Anne and Aaron, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. I think it's just an absolute blessing to not have to get on a plane. Great to be here too, Bill. 
Oh, it's good to have you guys. I think uh, it's going to be a, a good discussion, certainly something that's relevant to all the listeners. And uh, hopefully uh, we can hear some some positive stories as well as some of the challenges. So when we last talked to both of you, we you were kind of predicting or talking a little bit about what, uh, what challenges our listeners, growers uh, should expect to face during spring of 2022. Um, maybe predictions is the wrong word because it's based on your knowledge and things that occur year after year and uh, things that, that might be more prevalent these days than in the past. Um, and you walked us through some diseases uh, like botrytis, downy mildew, some of the TOSPO viruses and, and other things impacting greenhouse production recently um, that, that you were thinking were going to appear in greenhouses this year. So I know you're both researchers. You spend a lot of time in the field. You look at a lot of plant samples, some good and some bad. So how would you characterize the past season from a disease perspective? And why don't you, uh, why don't you let us know what you saw out there? I think one of the notable things, and it actually wasn't different this season, but one of the notable things to me was that there were so many challenges with both old and new diseases on propagative material a lot of bacterial diseases were popping up and they were definitely a big challenge. But on the plus side, getting to know how to use the newest fungicides, including Avelio, Positiva, and Sado, that was a, a really interesting thing to watch as well. You know, as Ann mentioned, uh, a lot of lot of bacterial issues um, last year. And, and I also, um, I'll mention that uh, it was an interesting year for me because it was at my transition to, to CPRO. Uh, so, you know, I will have officially been wearing the CPRO hat uh, for one year come uh, Cultivate. Uh, I feel compelled to say that I've been wearing the same hat for 45 years. So <laughs> that is probably the best part of my, my friendship with Aaron is we get to harass each other about stuff. Oh, for sure. And that's what makes this kind of conversation so dynamic and why I really like to have you guys on the podcast. And, and Aaron, congratulations on a year. I think, you know, you, you're doing a lot of uh, some of the similar things you've done um, throughout your career, but also some some new ones and probably seeing things from different perspectives. And, and that's always good. And, and you've been, uh, you've been looking at this stuff a, a long time, but it is interesting to hear about the fact that there are some new challenges out there. And also that, um, you know, the energy that, that growers uh, have when they have new chemistries at their disposal, some of the new fungicides are definitely showing a lot of uh, success in the greenhouse. Thanks for calling out a few of them. And I think that, you know, as, as we look at this, this past spring and, and a lot of the, the diseases um, that growers did face and the solutions that they did find, that, that frames our discussion pretty well moving forward, which is really going to focus on the current season for uh, folks that are listening to this in real time. It's week 25 going into 26 with a lot of the heat coming across most of North America. Um, but as we look at, at, at summer production, whether that's greenhouse or nursery, um, what exactly are some of the diseases that we're going to talk about today that are, that are common this time of year? Yeah, Bill, you know, this is uh, tis the season, you know, uh, coming into summer and, and warmer temperature, man, really uh, creates favorable environment for for disease and you know some of the the, the more common uh, pathogens that you're going to see active um, in under warmer conditions, uh, Phytophthora, you know, causing root, stem, crown rot, but also um, you know where where there's enough uh, moisture, it'll go up in, into the canopy, causing you know foliar aerial uh, blight. Uh, Rhizoctonia can do the same. And so, so that's another one uh, to look out for with aer aerial blight with rhizoctonia. And then, you, then you've got the soft rot bacterial pathogens. I mean, um, you know, Irwinia or, you know, you could say Pectobacterium decaya, the, the, the bacteriologists have always had fun with, uh, with the taxonomy, but what's collectively known, you know, is Irwinia, um, you know, big problems with soft rot um, during during these times, um, as as well as or, or these conditions. You said week twenty five, 
Uh, Xanthomonas um, is another one that definitely growers need to, to, to be aware of and, and keep a lookout for. And then um, one, one of my um, favorite diseases um, <laughs> is a Southern blight or a sclerotium rolfsii. Uh, that's one that, that uh, is, is can be highly prevalent in uh, on foliage crops here in, in South Florida, and it's it's one that that's always a delight to to find <laughs> to find. And in, in, uh, that should, that's I'm sure growers probably don't appreciate that, <laughs> but uh, you know to see in nurseries or greenhouses. Um, but but you know those are those are some of the the primary uh, pathogens. Uh, but you know it's it's also important. To note that, that you know there are some some pathogens and some diseases that you know occur year round. Uh, a pythium root rot, for for example, or anthracnose uh, causing leaf spots, and then um, and then fusarium is another one that uh, can be found uh, pretty much year round. Uh, fusarium diseases. It's important you know, to recognize uh, for growers that, that are using diagnostic clinics and such, um, or have the capability to, to look under a scope, you know, uh, fusarium is notorious uh, also as a, as a secondary saprophyte. So it's, it, it, you know, but, but the actual diseases caused by fusarium um, definitely uh, can be uh, and occur year round. One of the things, oh, I'm sorry, Erin, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I was, was going to turn it over to, to you. One of the things that I found interesting when I left University of Florida in the um, early 1990s was I really thought that I understood what diseases were going to happen where in the U.S. at what time of year. And I definitely would have agreed with this list that Erin and I put together. And I thought, well, I'm going to California. I'm not going to see a lot of these things. And you know what? I was so mistaken, seriously mistaken. What it turns out is that anytime you're growing certain kinds of plants and whether you, whatever part of the country you're in, these suckers are going to show up. And the weirdest thing that I saw the whole time that I was doing trials in California was that I could actually do botrytis trials hmm. in the summer, the middle of summer, if I had a super susceptible plant. And it did not matter that it was going to 110 and botrytis really doesn't like 110, but on an exocum, which turned out to be really susceptible, I could make that test work. So it's very bizarre. So even though we gave you a nice short list here, boy, the, it's almost like everything's open season when it comes to ornamentals. Sure. And then that, that makes a lot of sense. You did, uh, I mean, a lot of what you talked about are the the usual suspects, um, the ones that, that always come up on, you know, what are the top 10 diseases impacting growers across North America? I've heard a lot of these uh, repeated um, for good reason, because they're, they're problems that, that seem to occur definitely in the summer, sometimes throughout the year, and ones that, that everybody needs to understand in order to be able to combat them and then really to educate you know, the entire team in the greenhouse of what to look for and when, uh, you know, when to send those plant samples in and when to, uh, to take action on them. And I guess that segues into the importance of working with production teams. And I know you both travel quite a bit, visiting growers across North America, communicating with them, phone, Zoom, however, however they, they, they choose to communicate. So, I guess looking at looking at this early this year and and maybe even some stories from from last summer. What have you seen in your recent visits? And that's I'm going to leave that question open ended because I'm really interested to hear what what you have to say. And when I say open ended, I mean greenhouse disease, not just latest new restaurants you find in different cities or the TSA lines that are brutal these days. What do you guys think? What have What have you seen lately? <laughs> you know, we, we do, I mean, I have to say, I, I do have the opportunity um, to travel a lot. Unfortunately, I eat a lot at these nice restaurants and, you know, you know, when you're traveling and you're, you're having meetings around food, that's always not good for the, for the diet plan, you know, Bill, but, and it, but, you know, and the other thing I, I have to say, the TSA, at least I fly out of Miami a lot um, the, with the pre-check it's it, things have been, I've been impressed with the efficiency, you know, but it, again, that varies airport to airport, mm -hmm. but, you know, but it, yeah, there, there's, there's often, you know, there's a lot of pleasant and unpleasant things about traveling for sure. You know, 
for sure. <laughs> for sure. What about greenhouses? <laughs> well, green, <laughs> getting in and out of greenhouses, you mean, or just talking? Well, I mean, I'm sure there's pleasant and unpleasant, but what are you, what are you seeing in them? <laughs> I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna let Ann. We we came up with a nice list, so I'm gonna let cool. let Ann take take it over. Thanks, Aaron. One of the things that I would say is I, I would uh, second Aaron's review of TSA because <laughs> honestly, they've done a remarkable job, and I don't find it. I've been stunned at how fast I got through the airport, so I have no complaints about that either. One thing about, um, and maybe Aaron would agree, because he's a plant lover as much as I am, that if I go to a greenhouse, I'm always happy. If the mm. plants are healthy, I'm happy. This is great. They're beautiful. If they have an insect, I'm, well, I like insects. I think they're better than diseases most of the time. They're, you can identify them. And if they're sick, I'm happy. So pretty much no matter what's going on in a greenhouse, I'm happy healthy or not. But the list of things we came up with, and this is honestly, our best memory says this is stuff that either Aaron or I saw in the last month, whether it was a slide, I'm not a slide, an image that was sent to us or on site, which we've done a lot of, I'm going to run through the list. I don't know that it matters where we saw these, but I'll just run through it to tell you that we do know how horrendously complicated growers jobs are. I saw alternary leaf spot on Fatsia. This is one I worked on when I was at University of Florida. Bacteria on Alocasia. Boxwood dieback, which turns out to be an anthracnose. Cylindrocladium on rose liners. Box blight, which is another cylindrocladium. That's on boxwood. Erwinia is coming in on the poinsettia cuttings, at least some places. Aaron and I both saw that. Uh, Erwinia on many foliage crops, including aglaonema and diffenbachia. Fusarium on Echeveria. I saw this, believe it or not, in my backyard. I actually was able to get an isolate of Fusarium so I can do some trials on Echeveria. And I was so happy because I couldn't get any growers to fork any up. So I was really glad that I had it. The other things, uh, we saw gray leaf spot on Canna's. Gray leaf spot is pericularia. So tropical plants get it. <laughs> Bermuda grass gets it. I'm not Bermuda. St. Augustine, that's what it is. Um, Neofusicoccum, there's one I bet you hope that you never have to try and figure out, but it's like a, a standard canker on Podocarpus. Fomopsis, another canker type disease on junipers. Phytophthora, Spathophyllum, Boxwood, Distillium, which I have no idea what the name of that plant is, but causing leaf spots in Texas. Powdery mildew on roses in California and the Pacific Northwest. Rhizoctonia on Echeverias. As Aaron mentioned, his, one of his favorite diseases, the Southern blight or sclerotium ralsii on ZZ plants. I also was in Louisiana last week and saw Stegonospora, which is Miscanthus blight. It is a new blight as of the early 90s. I don't know where we got it, but it is just a very common and stunning thing to look at. I've seen Tephrina, which is leaf blister, also leaf curl, depending on what plant it's on. And it, you would never think that this was a fungus, but it is. It looks like a gall. Tomato spotted wilt virus on tomatoes and flowers in California, cut flowers being grown in the field, and a whole bunch of weeds with a virus and, of course, thrips. And then volutella on pachysandra. Aaron's been working with a grower on that one in South Florida. And believe it or not, Wilsonomyces, which is a shot hole fungus, it is very similar, and in the south, we see it actually, this shot hole caused by Xanthomonas, but I saw it on a prunus. And then finally, actually, I think one of Aaron's favorites, Xanthomonas on ficus. So the list is really kind of stunning when you think about what on earth is going on out there in the broad array of ornamentals that are grown. That's for sure. Do you think, I mean, a, a lot of those sound like they're on, uh, on crops grown outdoors. Um, is that is that true or is it are we seeing it on indoor grown and outdoor grown crops? So the list was pretty much both things. Mm -hmm. um, almost all of the woody things, we can say they're outdoor crops, some in shade houses, some in full sun. But honestly, the same stuff happens in propagation, which is once again a greenhouse. So we're it's kind of it really the, the borders between indoors and outdoors are really blurred. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, and, and and I'll just make one more comment, Bill. Uh, when Ann mentioned tomato spotted wilt virus, um, the thrips, man, uh, pressure of thrips right now is has been pretty tremendous. Uh, then I'm hearing that that's pretty much across the board. Uh, the you know in 
so so we definitely got to keep an eye out for for virus activity why do you, why do you, i mean i'm i'm interested what what does your gut say about why there is this is it heavier thrips pressure than you've seen other years or is this kind of par for the course it, well it, it it's um it's probably i would say it's it's par for the course but but um uh, you know we've had you know mealy bug uh, has been has been predominantly top of the list uh, mm -hmm. but this last this last little junket I went on visiting visiting greenhouses, um, you know, it seemed to be thrips um, were were the were primary concern. And then, Anne, I do have a, a I'm I'm throwing follow up questions at you guys because I'm Excellent. I'm hearing a lot of uh, a lot of common uh, issues when I talk to to different folks who look at greenhouse disease. And you mentioned the Irwinian poinsettia cuttings. I've heard that that can be either exacerbated by shipping, by the fact that, you know, we've got supply chain issues, plants, young plants sitting in trucks for longer than they should really heating up. Is that, am, am I, am I right about that? Or is that something that, that you guys have looked at? Bill, I, I think that you're right about it, but I would tell you that I always hear about Irwinia at this time of year. Mm -hmm. And so while the supply chain is not straightened out yet, it certainly isn't. Um, I've been astounded at how bad FedEx is operated. And I'm not supposed to say stuff like that, but it's just been amazing how late I get stuff that's paid for overnight. So mm -hmm. it's kind of bizarre. But I honestly, so shipping will make it worse, but I think part of the issue is Irwinia really does need a stressful situation. And if you cut a cutting off a plant and there's any of it around, and then you put it into a mist situation, which is what we have to do to get the roots on them, it's going to flare up. So I think we have to look at more preventative stuff. I know the best growers on poinsettia production really, really are super strict with how they um, manage the water and how fast they take it off of night water once they just get to a certain stage, that's it. And I know many of them are using wetting agents like capsule to help protect the poinsettia from desiccating it and without a ton of water being put on it. So I, I don't think that issue is different than normal years. Okay. No, that, that's interesting. I just had to, while I had you on, on the <laughs> podcast, I figured I'd go ahead and throw that follow up at you. And you, you made me think of one other thing. Honestly, a lot of times I have seen stuff, I think osteos, not osteosperm. Yeah, osteosperm. Those cuttings will just collapse mm. from conditions, not from any organism. I spent so long trying to get isolates of bacteria out of them and could never get anything. So cutting collapse due to what you're talking about could happen anytime. And it's maybe not Irwinia. Maybe it is just the fact that the, the biology of the plant gave up. Okay. Well, I know there's a lot of research going on into uh, to rehydration and cooling strategies for. Yeah, uh, that is that is ideal. Thinking a fungicide or bactericide is going to save us from everything is silly. It's not going to happen. No, interesting, interesting. So, I mean that that was a long list. I want to. I stopped counting at about twenty five. Um, I think it's a. It, I think once Aaron and I started to realize how many things we were seeing, it was kind of like. I don't know. It's probably, as people tell me often, job security. <laughs> That's a really good point. So why don't Gosh. we focus in on uh, a few of the specific diseases, maybe pick from that list or go where, wherever you want to go. Um, and when you either expect or most often see them appear in summer production. One of the things that we had talked about before we started recording was um, it was temperature ranges and some of the prime temperatures that these diseases will, will express or flare up. Um, are they, I guess, are, are a lot of them temperature uh, dependent or impacted by climate ranges? I'll start this off. Aaron's going to give us some, you know, kind of in-depth on the big ones for summer, but I would say my experience is and honestly, everything that's alive is impacted by temperature. So whether it's a fungus or a bacterium or the plant, it's all impacted by temperature. Whether you can do anything about it to make a, a, a preventative application, it, in my mind, the only reason to worry about temperature is to know when to expect something and try and get ahead of it. There's never going to be anything that works better as a cure than a preventative. Mm 
So when I was at University of Florida, I had at my disposal a bunch of growth chambers, and I tested a lot of the diseases that I worked on to see what were the temperature optimum. It wasn't for how was the best, what was the best temperature for the fungus or the bacterium to grow in, let's say, a petri dish. It was when did the disease do the most. And I'll give you a few of those. And I know Aaron and I put a little list together of these. Alternary leaf spot on Chef Larry's and everything in that family. The best temperature is 59 to 75. So if you go to Florida and you start looking around, you're going to see alternary a whole lot later than that. But that is the best temperature. Botrytis, the worst temperature for it, or the best temperature for the disease, worst for us, is 64 to 72. In contrast, and one of the reasons that we bring it up as a summer disease, or Winnie of blight in a general way, 82 to 93. Mm. Yeah, I'll I'll just mention something that that you know the optimum temperature range. But one one thing always to keep in mind is that some of these pathogens, um, you know, they can it's called like asymptomatic colonization. They're they're so they're there uh, and they're not causing symptoms often at temperatures that are outside this this optimum temperature range. And you know, talking about soft rot bacteria. With Erwinia, that's a that's just a classic uh, example of of you know how they can kind of take a ride on plants, and then you know they're there, they're not causing symptoms, but but once the temperature gets back into that range, it it it, it turns on. And and one one other thing I'll just mention is pretty remarkable is the uh, the Erwinia chrysanthemi, or now it's actually called Decaea chrysanthemi. You know, they, there's isolates where where they've had strains growing, you know, above 110 degrees, which is which is pretty remarkable. Um, yeah, so they, you know, uh, these some of these pathogens just never cease to to amaze us. Um, but yeah, and so the we also we mentioned fusarium and you know fusarium uh, pretty much occurring you know the disease is occurring year round uh, and and we've you know fusarium leaf spot temperatures between seventy and eighty one is is generally uh, ideal but then you know fusarium wilt actually uh, has a has a little broader range seventy to ninety uh, and then myrothesium uh, leaf spot. Uh, that that's generally 60 to 80. Um, we we see a lot of of myrothesium on foliage plants produced under shade, especially when they they put plastic up to protect them from from uh, you know winter temperatures. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'll get you know just a tremendous environment for for myrothesium, and and that's of course that's again these things depend on where you are, you know, in, 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 in the U S um, the Phytophthora, you know, we mentioned already is the disease of, you know, summer, summertime. So that, you know, most of your, your Phytophthora's um, in, in ornamentals, uh, you know, with, well, let me back up Phytophthora and Nicotiani is probably one of the most predominant species um, in ornamentals that that likes warmer temperatures. So that's why we're, we, we're seeing a lot of Phytophthora this time of the year. Um, and did you want to, do you want to chime in some more? Or? <laughs> sure. The, um, and I don't even remember where we got the data on powdery mildew, but powdery mildew really likes it better in say spring or fall. And that's optimum temperatures range from 70 to 84. Mm -hmm. uh, Pseudomonas is interesting because depending on the exact one and on the plant, it will tell you if it's a wintertime site pseudomonas or a, a summertime. But in general, they're really broad. So 60 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And then um, final one that I'll mention is Rhizoctonia aeroblite. I did a lot of research looking at the effect of air temperature and potting medium temperature and was working with uh, Rhizoctonia selenii on Boston ferns. And I found out that while the optimum temperature is very broad, 68 to 95, if you hit 95, they are done. Mm -hmm. They will not infect the leaves. And I would have said they would keep going given when I saw disease, but clearly that 95 degree air temperature stops Rhizoctonia. So obviously that's not something you're going to try and create, but it is just something to know that there's, a, there is an upper range on almost all of these things. Aaron, you want to finalize with uh, Xanthomonas? 
Sure. You, Xanthomonas, again, more typical during the summertime, um, you know, in, in ornamentals, it likes the temperatures, you know, 75 to, to 91 is, is a typical range, you know, depending, again, on the plant. And, you know, Anne mentioned, you know, the with Pseudomonas, and, you know, she did a lot of work uh, back in the day with bacterial um, diseases on hibiscus. And, and, and one of the neat things that, that she was able to show is that, you know, the, like she mentioned the pseudomonas, there's a warm season pseudomonas and a cool season pseudomonas, but xanthomonas, uh, you know, is predominantly the, the more common one that we see uh, in, under warmer conditions. Okay. I mean, it's the, the temperature ranges that, that both of you just gave kind of hit that sweet spot of summer production for just about all areas across North America. And that's exactly why we're having this conversation today. I think one of the things where well, you said two things that, that, that definitely need to be highlighted first is that prevention is almost better. And Aaron, you talked about the asymptomatic at, at certain temperatures outside the range, which really um, drives home that 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 need for preventative um, control uh, or preventative action, and then um, talking about the the air temperature and the media temperature. I guess both would need to be considered. Correct? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. The one thing about that, and I, I'll bring this up. I remember when I was at the Apopka Research Center, the horticulturists were looking at bottom heating. They wanted to see, you know, and Apopka doesn't have winter, but it has winter a whole lot more likely than Homestead does. But we actually took bottom heating and then air temperatures being whatever the norm was for the winter. And I could make summer diseases happen in the winter if I heated the soil up. And this was not a temperature that would damage a plant in any way, but I thought, you know, what a great thing to do, just create it so that all things can happen at all times. And, you know, for a plant pathologist, maybe we would like to do that, but we sure don't want to see the growers do it. Yep, and, and I'll just make one other comment uh, to add is for, for the nursery growers out there, recognize that some of these temperature ranges can be nighttime temperatures. You know, the, you know, you get areas where it cools down. So you have favorable conditions overnight. And that's, you know, that's why we always say, you know, don't, don't put your, don't put your plants to bed wet. You know, if you've got uh, excessive moisture, uh, you're just going to add um, to the recipe for disease. No, I think that that's, that's really good advice and something that, that might not, uh, might not be a, a thought until until you see the disease uh, express itself, and then you're like, "Wow, we're 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 really hot here," but those night temperatures were down in a range that was conducive. So, that's I think that that's really good information to to think about. Um, it it you know when we were talking about this this podcast and this topic, it it popped in my head that one of the things that the, the tech on demand team and some of the resources that we put together always seems to focus on are seasonal crops. And that's where a lot of the, the questions come up and a lot of challenges arise, you know, mums, poinsettias, pansies, other crops that are, that are grown um, for kind of the, the shoulder seasons or for different seasons outside of coarse spring. Although it is the coarse spring crops that make up the bulk of production in most greenhouses. Um, nursery probably a different story there but it's the out of season crops that that sometimes require the hardest work or the most diligence for for a lot of growers um so why why do you think that they're i guess what causes this increased complexity is it strictly temperature um or how how do you guys feel about or am i off base with that comment no, I think I would agree with you. Um, what I've seen over the years is really serious problems with the propagation more than anything, because things like vincas that are destined for a spring or summer um, sale date have to be produced in the winter and vincas don't like cold weather. So some of the diseases on vincas would never happen if they didn't have to be produced. The beginning of the crop didn't have to be done in uh, winter. Fall pansies is another example. I remember talking to a lot of people trying to uh, grow pansies in Texas. 
well, that's mm -hmm. really a challenge in September. It's really a challenge because it's still pretty hot. And they almost inevitably had to fight black root rot because the pansies are being grown for the fall, should it hopefully ever happen. And it's, it's just like super stress. And so I think it's almost all temperature. Yeah, yeah, I, I'd agree. And, and you know, one thing it just kind of dawned on me, uh, this is called tech on demand. And it's kind of funny because uh, a lot of these, these, especially some of the, the big box stores, they want plants on demand. And, mm -hmm. and you know, so and so it, it puts stress on, on growers even to try to stretch the limits of, of favorable times to grow plants. And, you know, poinsettia is a, just a classic example of a, of a really long season. And, you know, you, when you talk about poinsettia, it's, it's a tropical plant, you know, they originated in Mexico. And so, um, you know, the, uh, when you put it in, in, in production in cooler areas, um, you know, there's, there's going to be problems, stress, uh, you know, predisposed to disease. And, and uh, so, yep. Yeah, That's honestly, just simply the fact that it, the season is so tremendously long on a crop that has a very narrow marketing target. And it just means that, you know, if anything bad can happen, it's going to happen to a poinsettia. Yep. <laughs> yep. And that's, I think, why there's there's all sorts of preventative controls that, that growers use with poinsettia crops. They see these things, you know, pop up every year. And uh, and I think hopefully uh, most most production teams are ready for them. Um, but uh, man, it's there's still a need for a lot of education, I think, on, on some of these crops that, like you said, are being grown in conditions that is absolutely not what they're used to from a native perspective. And also, um, yeah, like you said, Aaron, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of demand um, for these products at retail and, uh, and I don't think that's going away. So it's, I guess it's on us to, to help educate growers on how they can be successful with crops that, that might um, might not be, uh, might not love the, the time of year that they're grown. It's kind of like, uh, kind of like lawns, in my opinion, sometimes they're just not meant to be in the place where they are, but man, we all want that green lawn. So, but it's, um, I guess, uh, before, before we wrap up, first off, you know, either one of you, if there's something that we've missed or something else you, you want to get off your chest related to summer, uh, diseases or summer greenhouse or nursery production. This is this is the time, and also uh, maybe uh, talk a little bit about some control strategies or new new products on the market. I know that that both of you trial and test a lot of products, um, so maybe talk about a little bit about uh, control and prevention strategies for some of these key diseases that you've talked about so far. I can uh, go ahead and start off with Phytophthora. Uh, it is definitely something that you want to prevent, not try and cure. Once you see it, you're probably looking at trash. So you really need to try and prevent it. Everything from one of the industry standards like Subdue Max is maybe the newest uh, or one of the newest products that is just targeting Phytophthora is Stegovis. And truly the phosphonates, things like Aliette and the other uh, fungicides in those classes are still extremely good. And I know Aaron, you and I were talking about some of the goals that CPRO is pursuing right now. Yeah, um, you know, CPRO has been in the aquatics uh, business a long time. And, you know, in aquatics, of course, algae is a big deal. And, and what's, what's um, interesting is that some of these, these copper and peroxide based algicides also have activity on the oomyces like Phytophthora and Pythium. So uh, I'm, I'm really excited at the opportunity to start screening some of these, these actives and, and formulations uh, to bring another tool uh, for Phytophthora. Yeah, I am too. Aaron and I were talking, get ready for this podcast. So here's one fortuitous thing that happened because we were talking. Uh, I'm doing a trial on Phytophthora crown rot on Vincas next week. And Aaron is going to get me a couple of these products so we can just do like a premier, not yeah, preview of what we might be able to see in the future. But I think it's really exciting anytime we can add something to our arsenal. That's interesting coming from uh, a, a different 
but somewhat related industry, the algicides for aquatics. That's yeah, one of the things that's weird, and I think anybody who isn't a uh, taxonomist would really probably didn't appreciate this too much, but the taxonomy people decided that Phytophthora wasn't a fungus, maybe what, five years ago, Aaron, something like that? Yeah. And they decided it's more closely related to algae. And that's <laughs> where Aaron and I said, fine, let's just see if that's the case or not and see if these algicides will work on Phytophthora. So I think it's a, you know, so we have to thank the taxonomist or something. <laughs> So how about Rhizoctonia? There are so many really good products, everything from an industry standard like thiophanate methyl 3336 uh, to medallion, all the 7-Eleven combos, which would include Broadform, Mural, Pageant, Orchestra, all of those, and some of the really interesting biocontrol agents like Obtigo or Obtego. Aaron's company has that product. Yeah, the, the nice thing, you know, the nice thing about the biologicals too with with Obtego is, is that you know it, it's if you do have any potential for resistance they're a nice resistance management tool because you know, you're bringing a you know a, a biological organism that's that's feeding on the pathogen so it's a different mode of action and also um we have a we have a a fungicide um in in the research pipeline right now and Ann's had an opportunity to work with it uh, that's very effective on rhizoctonia. So it'll be exciting to bring, and, and, and not only rhizoctonia, it's, it's, it's actually very broad spectrum. So it'll be exciting to bring a new new tool to the industry. We're just, we're at the mercy of the EPA. So stay mm -hmm. tuned on that one. <laughs> yeah, well, it is amazingly broad spectrum. One of the things that um, you were mentioning to me this morning was that it's showing really good results on Southern blighters, Florosum rolfsii. And some of the other products that have been good on that, Heritage definitely has been good. Back in the 90s, almost all we had at that point was uh, Terraflor, but that's not the case anymore. Positiva is very good on it. Your experimental product that you just mentioned is very good. And interestingly enough, Astun has been really good on Southern Blight in some of the trials that have been done. So why don't you wrap up bacteria? Because bacteria is one of the super mainstays of the products that CPRO has in their portfolio today. Yeah, um, you know that's that's one of the things. It's uh, fun fun to work with uh, products that have activity on on bacteria, just because they're so darn difficult to to control. But yeah, we have a a, a couple a number of copper based fungicides such as Cupro five thousand Junction and Camelot O. And then, you know, the same can be said for screening some of these aquatic uh, materials. Um, you know, we could look at activity on bacteria as well. So excited to, to, to move in, you know, move down the, down the road with uh, maybe bringing a new bacteria side or uh, formulation uh, to, to the market at some point. Yeah, and you know, I'm excited about looking at algicides because I have nothing but requests from people about what's safe to put on the plants that'll control algae. And we're just talking mainly about the green algae that grow on absolutely everything from leaves to potting medium to the concrete under the bench to anything. So I'm excited about the possibility that we could do something much more broad spectrum than just bacteria or just algae. If we could get somewhere with controlling quite a few of the problems, that would be fantastic. I know that uh, the, the folks working for all uh, different plant companies around the industry get a lot of calls on how do I deal with algae. So uh, that is definitely, definitely exciting. And Aaron, you've been at CPRO a year now. It's got to be really exciting to, to see some, some new chemistry, some of the things that are in the pipeline in development. I bet you're having a blast with that. I, Bill, I am. I mean, it, it is, it's the, the aquatic side is just a whole new world for me. So I'm, I'm definitely learning, um, a lot and, uh, you know, we, it's like being a kid in a candy store, you know, playing with all these different actives. So yeah. And, and hopefully, uh, sooner than, than later, we can, we can introduce some new tools to the industry. For sure. I can tell that you both like this. And you said earlier that, that any time in a greenhouse is a good time because you like the, yes. the beautiful, healthy plants. You like the ones with bugs on them and you like the diseases. I thought that was yeah, I virtually awesome. the only thing I, I absolutely hate to see is plants that haven't been watered enough. Mm. That bugs me to death. I feel sorry for them. And you wouldn't think somebody who kills plants for a living would feel sorry for them. But I actually feel sorry if a plant didn't get watered enough. 
Well, some of these diseases and, and bugs seem like it's very hard to avoid, but uh, underwater plants, I'm pretty sure that's uh, that, that comes down to training. So um, <laughs> definitely, I hear you. We, we are remarkably resistant to being trained as human beings. You know that. Anybody, I don't know. I didn't end up with any children, but I see enough adults that don't do what they're supposed to do. That's kind of impressive. Uh, this That is a topic for a different podcast. And uh, <laughs> I'm sure it would get a lot of uh, downloads because training, whether it's kids or staff or spouses or coworkers, it's it's definitely <laughs> you know what you just you just made a mistake you're not supposed to ever say that you train your spouse He's no matter who you are to <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh that's a bad one yeah well, well, that's awesome. hey, i had to i had to be taught how to how to wash the dishes properly <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah i think the the spousal training definitely goes one way more than the other way but uh, again we're not getting into that right now um that's a that's a thorny subject but as we as we wrap this up why don't um can you guys let the listeners know how they can contact you and find resources because both of you are such you know wealth of knowledge with great experience and always happy to talk um talk plants and diseases and and strategies with really anybody that you come across i know that for a fact so where where can folks listening find resources and and for your for your different companies and um and maybe possibly some of those solutions you guys were talking about as well ladies first oh thank you so i see yeah, you're saying i trained you well huh <laughs> <laughs> um you, you can reach me at the same email that i've been at for really quite a while now a r chase c h a s e at chase research.net and I can answer a question about where to look for things or whatever. But one thing I'll mention is that Mike and I have really expanded our efforts to create tools to help you figure out what to do with diseases, all the way from a wheel that has the best conventional and armory listed and Spanish on one side and English on the other, the best products out there for the key diseases and a whole series of ID wall charts. And anything you want to know, you can be very uh, feel comfortable to give me an email. If you want to text me 530-391-3068. I'd be glad to talk to you. Excellent. And I'll give a shout out to the resources that, that Ann and Mike created. They really are top, you know, top spot on your, on your wall in your office and uh, things that you want to keep handy and probably buy a few and share them out with, with your team, the folks uh, in, in management of the production, because um, they're easy to use. And you guys have really worked hard to, to make sure that they're understandable. And uh, even some of the color coded charts make so much more sense than just looking at lists of frac codes and things like that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, I, anytime I get an excuse to make something with different <laughs> colors, I'm happy. Awesome. Awesome. Aaron, how about, uh, how about you and CPRO? Yeah, hey, I just I want to make a comment that that Anne is is probably one of the, she's super responsive on email, probably one of the most responsive people I've I've collaborated with. Uh, she'll turn an email around very quickly, uh, but but the best way to to reach me is is by email, and that is Aaron P at cpro dot com. So that's A A R O N P at cpro s e p r o dot com excellent i'll put uh, i'll put this information in the in the show notes probably not going to put your phone number in there and just because who knows what yeah, happens when you put you. something online but uh email addresses yeah. and and the websites where you can find uh the the different resources both for for Anne's company and for cpro so well we talked about a lot of diseases a lot of uh a lot of different strategies and, and some great information on uh, when sort of the optimum temperatures uh, for those diseases, which I think is excellent information. And uh, so to both of you, I really appreciate your time as always. And the fact that you came back to join Tech On Demand, we didn't scare you off last time. And uh, I know for a fact that, that our listeners really get a lot out of the insights. And I know that because they, they tell me, um, you know, I always ask, Hey, you know, tell me the podcast that, that you heard that, that really resonated. And, uh, that last one we did gets mentioned quite a bit. Um, and they're sharing it with their teams and telling them to listen. So I think that 
that is really good uh, a good a good complement to the information that, that you both uh, present and your high level of expertise. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you for the opportunity. For sure. And we're going to have to, we'll have to do this again and maybe take a look at, uh, we might do this video somehow next time so that we can look at some of these diseases in action and discuss them. I am Bill Calkins with Tech On Demand, reminding you to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app like iTunes, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, and we're now on Odyssey and you will never miss an episode and jump back into the archives because there are more than 20 episodes like this one packed with great information and fantastic guests. So here's to a fantastic rest of your 2022 season and beyond. Talk to you soon.